Oh, and Mark is coming tomorrow morning. Mark, the one that did the presentation at the nursing home with us. Because he wants to. Okay. Because <laughs> he wants to see it. I know. I guess he's going to meet us there. Okay. Sounds like most of you have finished up. You have the data sheet. Awesome, thank you. Okay, so let's have a little bit of discussion time really quick. So you guys just recorded data. Did anybody have difficulty using the test strips or have questions about using the test strips? Pretty easy, straightforward. Um, okay, let's think about test strips and collecting water chemistry data really quick. What do you think are the positives of using test strips versus using like a digital reading? Like having a probe or something, like the probe goes in the water and it gives you a digital reading. What are some advantages or disadvantages of using test strips? Yeah. Yeah. Good. So what you're kind of getting at is there's a lot of user bias with test strips, right? Because you have to decide how long to keep it in the water, and you have to decide exactly what color it is, right? Um, and do you think maybe like one person might think it's one color and one person might think it's a slightly different color? The exact same one? Okay, good. So that might be a downside of using a test strip, you're right. Anybody have, um, can you think of an advantage of using test strips instead of digital readings? Right. Good, good. So it's a trade-off kind of, right? There's a trade-off between how much time you want to spend using a probe and setting up a probe and calibrating a probe. Have you guys ever had to calibrate probes before or use probes before? They take a really long time to calibrate sometimes. Um, and then it's a trade-off also with how much money you have, right? Has anybody ever purchased a probe or looked into how much they cost? Like even a pH probe or a um, ammonia probe or nitrite probe, they can be hundreds of dollars for one of those probes. So if you don't have, um, you know, a lot of money, like maybe you're a teacher and you're purchasing a lot of your own equipment for your classroom, maybe you don't have money to buy a lot of that fancy equipment, right? But maybe you do have money to buy one of those test strip kits. So in one of those test kits, there's a hundred tests in one of those containers and they're about $20 each. Okay, so depending on how many times you decide to sample, that might be more cost effective. So just keep that in mind when you do decide to develop your own system if you want to. You know, what are the trade-offs? Maybe your teacher already has um, probeware that they use in their classroom. Like a lot of AP environmental science teachers already have that. A lot of AP bio teachers have stuff like that already too. So you might not even have to consider getting test strips at all. Okay. Um, so there's lots of user bias, though, and that's kind of what I wanted to talk about next. So tank one, who had tank one? Okay, you guys, you two groups had tank one. So tank one, one group got 40 for nitrate, and one group got 80 for nitrate. So look at your sheet, um, not the sheet, sorry, the um, key. Look at what 40 looks like compared to 80. They're different, aren't they? They're definitely, one is definitely more pink than the other, right? So that's a good example right there of user bias, right? Um, what else? Nitrite, you guys both said zero, which is good. And you both said that hardness is 150. You said chlorine is zero. You said alkalinity is 40. And one group said pH is 7.2. And one group said that pH is 7.8. Um, so again, some user bias. And um, ammonia was zero. Okay, so any thoughts, um, group with tank one, about what's happening in your tank? Well, we 
we expect it to be like more secluded and the central facility is very good consumed from the system and then there's still a bit of nitrate left, but there's thin nitrate that's been produced already by the third step mm -hmm. the cycle, so probably somewhere after. Good. Okay, so you think it's kind of near the end of nitrogen cycling. What about you guys? That's what you said too, for the same reasons? Okay, very good. So you're right, um, tank one is actually an aquaponic system that we have downstairs that you guys will see in a second. And it has been um, going through nitrogen cycling now for about two and a half years. We've had it down there for a long time. But what ends up happening is you do see the whole progression. Usually you see zero ammonia, zero nitrite, and then a lot of nitrate for a long time. And then maybe something slightly different happens where maybe um, you feed your fish more pellets of food one day than you do the next day, and you see this tiny little blip of ammonia or a tiny little blip of nitrite, right? So something just very small happens in your system and you might see a tiny bit of ammonia or nitrite come up. Um, if you see a lot of it and it's sustained, then you know there's something wrong, right? Like maybe you accidentally added chlorine with your tap water and you killed all of your bacteria. And then you might have to start nitrogen cycling all over again. And the cycle that Emily was showing you, remember the big X and Y axis? That whole cycle takes about 30 days. So if you do kill your bacteria, it might take a little bit of time to get it all started again, just so that you have a thought about timeline here. Okay, um, tank three. So that was you guys, right? And you guys, all the ladies. Okay, so tank three, one group had 40 for nitrate and one group had zero for nitrate. That's different, isn't it? That could like drastically determine what you think is happening with your system, whether or not it has nitrate, right? Um, nitrite, you have zero and zero. Hardness, you had 75 and 150. Chlorine, you had zero and zero. Alkalinity was 40 and 40. pH was 7.8 and 8.4. So both of you still had a higher value for pH than the other system has, so that's good. And your ammonia was zero. So who wants to tell me what you think is happening in your tank? Okay. We thought this because there's significantly less ammonia and significant amount of nitrates in the system. However, the reason why we thought it's more sustainable is because of the pH level, just just significantly more alkaline compared to like being active. Interesting. Okay. Good points. Very good. What about you guys? Okay, good. So as you guys can see, the change in your nitrate amounts completely changed what you guys think is happening in your aquaponic systems, right? You guys had some nitrate in your system, so you think it's near the end, and you guys had zero, so you think it's at the beginning, right? So that could play a huge factor in what we say is happening with our systems. Um, one thing I want you to look at really quick with these test strips, this is why nitrate is kind of confusing to measure on here. Does everybody, so first take a look at what um, zero looks like on your nitrate on the key. It looks like it's kind of cream colored, right? Okay, look at what happens. When I take this strip out of here, what color is it before you even dip it in water in the first place? On the very top. Kind of brown. Okay, so that's already pretty dark compared to zero, right? And I haven't even dipped it in water yet. So if it stays this color after I dip it in water, what do you think the, amount, the nitrate level probably is? Yeah. Probably zero, right? So you kind of have to be a little careful, like see what the, the um, test strip looks like before you even use it. Because sometimes these keys can be a little bit deceiving. So just one thing to keep in mind if you guys do use the test strips, okay? Um, what I want to show you, I'm going to explain why you see that pattern really fast. Let's go all the way back here. Okay, so typically, if you had zero, zero, zero for ammonia, nitrate, and nitrate, you would think, oh, that's at the very, very beginning of my system, right? 
Like the fish haven't even really started producing feces yet. We haven't really seen anything happen, right? Now, can anyone think of one other scenario where you might see zero for all of them? You'll have to think through this a little bit in your head, probably. Yeah. Maybe the fish die. What do you think would happen if the fish die? What would decrease? The ammonia would decrease if a fish died? What happens when animals decay? <laughs> it's like waste, right? It's like manure, essentially. So you'd actually see a huge spike in ammonia if a fish dies. It's a good thought, though. Yeah. Oh, everybody hear that? Maybe near the end, maybe if your plants are taking up all of the nitrate that's available. Okay, so theoretically what you should see in an aquaponic system is you should see this nitrate level stay pretty high. But the one time that you might see this drop down is if you have way more plants in your system than you should, right? Say the ratio of your plants to your fish is really, really high. Right? You have a ton of plants and you have like one fish. Okay, all the poop that's coming from the fish is not going to be able to sustain this nitrate level up here, right? So eventually what you will see is when the plants get really large and they're taking up a ton of nitrate, you may actually see that nitrate level dip down. What's one way that you could kind of combat that problem from happening? What did you say? You could add more fish. What's another option? Decrease the number of plants. One of those, right? So this is kind of always a fine balance between the ratio of your plants to your fish. Does that make sense? Okay, so you understand why it could be zero, zero, zero and not be at the beginning. Okay, cool, very good. Good job. All right, let's go to this next part really quick. So question for you, now that we have collected data, I want you guys to tell me a couple of reasons why you think it's important to collect data. Because it's obvious for us, right? We're scientists. We work at a research institute. We like data. We like numbers. We like analyzing things for no reason sometimes, right? But if you guys are in a classroom and you have a lot of work to do one day, right? You're doing like lots of homework and your teacher gives you an assignment and then you have a test tomorrow and everything. You're thinking like, ugh, I still have to collect data. Maybe you start thinking like, it's really not that important, right? If I collect data today, maybe I could wait for tomorrow. I want us to brainstorm some ideas. Why is it important that we should collect data? What are some reasons in general to collect data? It doesn't have to be related to aquaponics necessarily. Yeah. Uh, you know, like kind of like gap promote which way your data should be kind of uh, headed towards. Um, you can see if there's any like problems. Like if there's too much plants or, or like plant growth and around the fish, you can see that when um, when you test and collect data, and you can see, especially if you collect data and you can graph it later, you can see um, how the graph um, is like being constructed, and just you can analyze and um, like predict results. Off of that too. Good. Okay, good. So collecting data, you may actually be able to see problems that are occurring in your system, right? If you didn't collect data, but you had a bunch of plants growing and it said zero, 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 would you know that your nitrate was at zero necessarily? Probably not. What, what would you maybe start seeing happen though? What would you start observing if you weren't collecting data over a long period of time? Yeah, your plants maybe aren't growing as well as you expected them to grow, and then you would have no idea why, right? You'd be like, well, maybe they have a disease. And it could be as easy as the fact that like, you just don't have nitrate in your system, but you would never know that, right? Good. Any um, other ideas why we should be collecting data? Good. 
yeah, that's like the whole basis for making predictions and for trying, to, trying out new experiments and manipulating variables, right? It's all based on what we saw in our last experiment, what data we collected. Go ahead. Do you have another one? Yeah, good. Your data could actually help you innovate or make new improvements and optimize your system even more, right? And again, something you maybe wouldn't know unless you did collect data. So just a couple things here. You can maintain a healthy system, making sure that everything is staying on track the way it should. Um, optimizing experiments, there you go. Addressing instability before collapse happens. So you start seeing your nitrate going down and you're like, oh, maybe I should add another fish before my plants start dying, right? Um, and then also better understanding the system in general. That's just the basis for understanding how the system works is important, right? Okay. So now we know how to collect data. Now what's going to be important is if your values are too low or too high, have we, have we figured out yet how to address that problem? Except for the adding fish and taking away plants and vice versa. We haven't really learned about anything that we can do to our water, like if we need to add extra chemicals into our water to change pH or anything like that, right? So Courtney's gonna to talk to you for a second about how to maintain your system. So once you do collect data, you'll figure out kind of what you need to add to your tank to make it healthy and keep it stable, okay? You guys have any questions yet or so far? Oops. Don't read. Whoa, I went that really far way back. back. <laughs> Okay, so this is what okay, thanks. Um, this is what we call our aquaponics system decision tree. So, based on whatever values you get from your test strips, we can look at this and see if there's any actions that we need to take to maintain a healthy system. So, the uh, where's the laser on this? Okay, look at that. Okay, so this specific tree is dependent on um, or like these values right here are dependent on um, fish species. So whatever fish you're growing, this, this is for our tilapia, right? Mm -hmm. So this is specific for tilapia. So if you're not growing tilapia, these values are gonna change. Um, so these are, you're gonna compare your values that you get from your test strips to these values right here. And then from these values, you can drop down and see whatever action you need to take. So if your pH is really high, you can look and see you need to add however much pH down. So, um, so based on this data right here, compare, let's compare these values to these values over here. Can y'all see that? Okay. It's kind of hard to read on the yellow, but um, let's compare these values to these and see if there's any actions that we need to take to maintain our healthy system. Yeah, it's hard to read it.
Uh, does somebody want to share one one thing that you would do? Mm-hmm. Perfect. Anything else that we would do? Mm-hmm. Is there anything else? Oh, that's right. <laughs> okay. Sorry. So why would you want to add bacteria if your nitrite level is too high? It's not right. It's not that you're tracking that, okay? And this system was already previously settled, right? But remember how we talked about maybe there's some weird thing that happens to your DNA that makes you want to be fertilized? Maybe you get a little nitrite. So then we're going to do the same thing, but using the data you just collected from your water samples. So look at your data set and compare it to these values right here. And you already know that these are from our systems downstairs. So we have tilapia, and we're growing lettuce, and um, what else? And we've already cycled, so both the systems are already cycled. All right, you guys figured it out? Okay, does someone who had sample one want to share what you would do based on the values that you got? Mm -hmm. So all of those are normal to pH because they're all going to be Mm hmm. Any, but anything else for sample one? Anything different? Okay, what about sample three? Mm -hmm. Anybody get anything different for sample three? Okay.
So, what should you expect from being a Project Feed ambassador? Probably all wondering. Um, so, these are a couple of the things that um, all of the ambassadors that have gone through our program are doing or have done. Um, last year, we had 18 high school students that were ambassadors, all from different schools around Seattle. Um, right now, we also have six full-time ambassadors that are here, well, full-time. They're here Monday, Wednesday, Friday for eight hours every day. Um, and they're basically doing the same thing that you guys are doing, um, just they're here for a few more hours over the summer than you will be. But your, your goals, like your ultimate goals for integrating programs into your schools or your communities are the same, okay? So the first thing um, that uh, is really important for all ambassadors is developing a plan to integrate Project Feed into your school or community center. So the first thing you might wanna start thinking about is where do you already have connections in your communities or in your schools? Do you have teachers that you get along with really well already? Are you part of an after-school club? Are you involved in um, like the Rainier Valley Garden Club that maybe isn't even involved in school at all? Um, I have one intern right now who volunteers at the Pacific Science Center and she wants to do like a cart, like a traveling cart um, to teach people that come about aquaponics. Um, so think about how you can leverage the interactions that you already have every day to incorporate the program into your, your communities, okay? Um, number two, you're gonna be creating resources for others to use, um, to use your plan. And all of those are gonna be accessible through your Project Feed 1010 website profile. Each of you are gonna have a profile on our website, which I'll show you in just a second. And all of the resources that you develop for people to use and share are gonna be on there for people um, to access around the world. So if I'm a student down in Florida, you know, unfortunately, they don't have the same resources to be able to come to ISB and do a workshop with us and everything. But they might say, um, oh, Claire's school looks a lot like my school. Like she wrote down on her profile that she has 1,500 people in her school and she has AP classes that are offered. And that sounds a lot like my school. I wonder if her plan would work for me too. And then they can go into her website profile and actually use all of the resources to get started on their own, okay? So that's the idea with um, the resources that you're gonna create. And I'll go through each of those resources in a second. Um, next, you're gonna integrate your plan into your community and you'll receive assistance from us throughout the entire school year. So starting from like today, all the way until our showcase, which is in June, um, you will have essentially 24 seven access whenever I'm on my email um, and whenever you know everybody else is able to answer emails too. If you ever have questions, you can ask us. If you wanna stop by ISB and you need help building something you can, um, we are here for you guys and to help you guys get started, okay? So whatever you need, let us know. So you're developing the plan first and then down here at the beginning of the year, you'll integrate your plan. And then at the end, we're gonna share and celebrate your success um, in June next year. We haven't decided on the date yet, but essentially what we do is we invite all of your families, your friends, your um, teachers, your principals, um, whatever other community organizations you worked with, they will all be here. And they'll all be here to support you and celebrate you and um, they wanna see you kinda shine and see what you did, right? So you guys will be doing like a short, what we call lightning talk, which is about five minutes long about your work that you did over the school year. And then you'll also have a scientific poster that you make and that you'll be showcasing. Um, and all of us, like I said, we'll be meeting on Google Hangouts every month to kind of work through this process. So I'll teach you guys how to make scientific posters in PowerPoint. We will print out the posters for you here, um, which those are really expensive if you've ever printed one. They're about $300 each, because um, they're three feet by four feet. <laughs> they're huge and they're all color um, on very nice paper. So we'll do all of that for you too. Um, we'll teach you how to use a variety of other resources online. So 
And this is kind of a fun, exciting way to celebrate everything that you guys do at the end, okay? Um, so let's think about ideas really quick for how to integrate this project into your communities. And like I said earlier, what I want you to think about is how you can use your interests and your skills and also leverage the relationships that you already have. So rather than kind of like trying to force it, like, oh, I don't really know any teachers very well, but I guess maybe I'll try to meet one and see if they want to do aquaponics. You, that might work, um, but it's probably going to work a lot better if you know someone already and they're already kind of incorporated into your lives and they know who you are and they trust you already, okay? Um, but the other thing to think about are what are your interests and your skills? Um, you don't necessarily have to do this project the same way that everyone else does. And that's what Dr. Baliga was saying earlier, is that every intern last year did something very different than every other intern, um, just based on their skills and interests. And so what I have on this slide for you, I'm not going to play these now, um, but this PowerPoint presentation is going to be in a Google Drive folder that I share with you in a, in a little bit today. I want you to click on this link and it'll take you to YouTube and it'll show you the five minute showcase presentations from this last June. And you can start getting ideas of how people use their skills and their interests to incorporate this project. Um, we had some interns that aren't even necessarily interested in STEM. They wanted to do um, like communications, for example, or they wanted to um, do computer coding or science or something, which is STEM, obviously, but something that's not quite directly related to biology, necessarily. Um, we also have our website here, so if you haven't been here yet, this is a really good resource. So you just go to this Collaborate tab and then learn from our ambassadors. And these are all of our 18 ambassadors from last summer. And they each have their own profile. And you guys will have a whole separate section for 2017 ambassadors. You'll each have your own page. Um, so for example, if we go to Laura's page. So this is all the information about Laura. One of the resources she made was a blog post, which is what you guys are going to do too. I'll talk about that later. This is her blog post link. Um, this is all information about her and her school and her project. This is her plan to incorporate it into her school the challenges that she thinks she'll face getting it set up. And then these are some of the other resources that she created, like I was mentioning earlier. Okay, So that's kind of the landing page that each of you will have. Um, so feel free to check, th check out all of those different ambassadors pages. Um, here's a couple of quick ideas I just threw out, just because this is what some of the other interns did last summer. Um, you could integrate the curriculum that I showed you earlier into one of your teacher's classroom's curricula. Um, you could, we had one intern last year that actually did a TED talk right here. So she found an organization that does the TEDx talks and um, gave a presentation. Um, you can build an aquaponics system with a club or a community group. You could start a citizen science group with aquaponics, so collecting data and uploading it online and sharing it with ISB. Um, also, I had a student down in the bottom right that um, wasn't able to build an aquaponic system in a school because their administration wasn't very supportive of it. But he really liked teaching other people about aquaponics. So he went around with me to all of the different outreach events that I did throughout the year. So he went to like middle schools with me and um, elementary schools and talked to them about sustainable agriculture. So basically everything is open. Um, whatever you want to do, I want to help you figure out a way to do it. Um, if you want to like partner with me throughout the year and help me do outreach, um, one of uh, Laura, who I just clicked on, she loves writing websites. Um, so she helped us develop our entire website throughout the school year. Um, so the options are kind of limitless. Whatever you guys want to do, let me know. We can figure out a way to make it work. Okay. Um, if you do want to hold your own outreach event, like. Um, you want to go back to your elementary school where you went to school and give back to them. Um, I have a whole folder in Google Drive called Four Outreach Events, <laughs> and it has like a PowerPoint presentation for you. It has all the worksheets you need for the students to hand out to them. Um, it has like a teacher guide kind of to tell you like what to say on each slide. So if you want to go that route, you can use those materials too. Okay? Any questions so far? Um, oh, my animations aren't showing up correctly. 
<laughs> okay. Um, if you want to do the citizen science route, which means you're probably going to build an aquaponic system, collect data, and upload it online, these are some of the things that you're going to need. Um, and I just wanted to lay this out because it's not as hard as it sounds. Um, right here, the first thing you need is an aquaponic system, obviously, right? And there's a couple ways you can go about doing that. We have these small three-gallon systems here called back-to-the-root systems. They're very, very small. They cannot grow very much food. Um, and because they're so small, they're limited by the number of fish. You, you're, it's limited by the number of fish you can put in it, right? Um, what I mean is the opposite. The tank size limits how many fish you can have. So if you only have like one beta fish in there, or one goldfish, what do you think is going to happen with your water chemistry? Any thoughts? Hmm? You guys know water chemistry now. You can share. What do you think is going to happen if I only have one very small fish? Probably not going to be very much nitrate, right? Because it's not producing very much ammonia in the first place. So if I don't have very much nitrate, what do you think will happen with, if you're trying to grow plants? Probably not going to be much growth, right? Um, which might not be that exciting, depending on your objectives of your experiment, right? Um, you can grow things like wheatgrass and radish sprouts, which conveniently are the seeds that they give you in the kit because they know that they will grow with very limited nitrate, right? Um, so you can, we can give you one of these kits. We do have these available for you, and you can take this with you and use it. Um, but keep that in mind that you are going to be really limited by the amount of ammonia that's produced and the amount of nitrate that's produced, okay? Um, the other options are, there's another um, kit company that they are gonna send us kits, and they're 10 gallons. So they're essentially the same idea. You have like a kit with everything that comes with it, but they're 10 gallons instead of three. So it's about three times that big. Um, when those do come in, if you want to do that, I can give you one of those kits to use in a classroom or a community center. Um, and then the other option is making your own system. I like that option the best because you can scale it up, you can scale it down, you can add whatever components into it that you want to, you can make it into kind of an event with a club, um, you can make it into an event with a classroom. It's a lot more fun, I think, but it's totally up to you. Um, that also requires you though to go through and figure out what parts you need and get them from different places and all of that fun engineering stuff, okay? So um, that's the first thing you'll need is an aquaponic system. The second thing you'll need are the resources to be able to maintain your aquaponic system, right? So you need like your six in one water test strips, you need your ammonia test strips, and then you need like pH up and pH down. And then if you don't buy a kit, you're also gonna need like bacteria, your fish food, your water pump, your dechlorinator for your water, all of that stuff. Okay. Um, I have a link right here. This is our Amazon wish list. We basically just put together a list of all of the things on Amazon that you guys would need for um, doing citizen science. So you can just go onto our list right here and be like, oh, this is the bacteria I need to order. This is the pH up I need to order. Okay. And then over here, like I said, I'm going to give you guys access to um, a Google Drive folder. How many of you have used Google Drive before? Everybody has? Have you used it before? If you're confused, I'll help you figure it out, okay? Basically, it's just an online folder that has everything in it that you would need. Um, and here I have those data collection forms, like this, like digital copies of them. I have the water chemistry testing guide, like this. And I have um, that decision tree that Courtney was using with you guys, um, as well as that folder that's all of the outreach materials that you would need to do an outreach event. Okay? But these are the things you would need to do citizen science with. Um, like I was mentioning a second ago, there are items that are available to you already. Um, like the first one is a Back to the Roots aquaponics kit. If you want to use one of these, we already have them, so you don't need to purchase one. Um, but remember, they're only three gallons. We also have this very um, interesting assortment of materials because Fred Hutch donated all of their stuff from one of their labs to us. So we have about 50 30 gallon fish tanks. So they're pretty big. I mean, they're decent sized fish tanks. We have multiple tilapia in um, each of them. So they're, they're pretty big. So if you want to do, do your own um, design and build your own system, you can use these fish tanks that are 30 gallons. We'll give those to you for free. Um, we also have aerators. 
These are really important when you start reading about aquaponics. You need to increase your oxygen levels in your water, both for your plants and for your fish. So we do have aerators. Um, we also have fish nets. They had a bunch of extra fish nets. So those are kind of the three things that we have a lot of if you do want to build your own system. Um, like I said, we will likely have this other kit. They just haven't sent it to us yet, so I don't want to be like, yeah, they're definitely giving it to us because they're not here. So that says something. <laughs> um, but those will be 10 gallons. And then um, you know, other resources for you, if you're trying to get money to build any of these kits or buy any systems or anything, um, I can, all of us can help you find funding through different grants. We can help you write applications for those grants and proposals to get money. Um, basically, we want to be here to support you guys to do whatever it is that you want to do. Um, this is actually a picture of Courtney's mom. She wrote a grant down in Texas. She's an AP environmental science teacher. She got $5,000, right? She got a $5,000 grant just for this aquaponics project through her district. Um, and we kind of like, you know, supported her in writing that. And um, she used our website for resources and all of that stuff too. So that happens quite a bit where teachers can get grants. Um, there's also this cool thing called Donors Choose. Has anyone heard of that? Have you heard of crowdfunding before? You know, like Kickstarter? Okay, so Kickstarter is kind of like Donors Choose, except Donors Choose is only for teachers. The only people that can put projects on Donors Choose are teachers. Um, so this is nice because we've had about 10 teachers that have needed materials to build aquaponic kits, and they go in and they explain like how the kit's gonna benefit their students, what type of students they have, what they're gonna learn from building these systems, and then 100% um, of the teachers that have ever done this through Donors Choose, through Project Feed, have always gotten their projects funded 100%. So we can help you do that too, okay? Um, oh, back to citizen science. Okay, so if you're doing citizen science, the first thing you're probably going to have to start thinking about is determining your question, like your research question. What do you want to examine, right? Do you want to look at how plant species influence fish growth, or do you want to look at how fish species influence plant growth? Um, do you want to see how dissolved oxygen increases plant growth? Um, you can increase the number of fish or decrease the number of plants or combine the different plant species and see if that helps them grow better, right? So there's kind of, a t there's a ton of different questions you can ask if you're doing um, citizen science. But that's your first step before you even decide which system you want to build or make or buy. Um, you probably need to first figure out what your research question is so you know how big of a system you need, okay? Um, next, you're going to build your aquaponic kit or your system. Um, and like I said, you can also build your own. So this was the design from one of my students that um, bought everything at Goodwill. So this was a vase, a glass vase from Goodwill. This is a cereal bowl right here. Um, this is a siphon that allows the water to fill up all the way to the top. And then once it reaches a certain point, it um, basically siphons all the water back down into the fish tank. And she built that siphon out of a straw, a test tube, and a falcon tube from her chemistry class. They're all plastic. So completely free materials there from her teacher. Um, and then one of my other students actually built their own siphon from um, this little foosball man here, and a couple pieces of PVC pipe from Home Depot, and a plastic ball. <laughs> and it functioned exactly like any other siphon you would buy for $50 online. So this is kind of a fun engineering project. If you guys are in like a, an engineering class or a physics class and you want to maybe do a challenge, like who can build the best siphon in your physics class or something, that would be pretty fun. Um, another option is doing really low cost items, kind of like this Goodwill option here. You can use substitute materials that you find at your house. So this fish tank on the bottom was actually a Costco laundry detergent container. Um, on the top you have a muffin pan. That's where your plants were growing. Um, there's a little water hose here from home and some plastic cups over here on the side for your plants to sit inside of. So there's lots of options if you want to build your own as well, if you don't want to buy a system that's pre-made. Um, next, you'll collect data just like we all learned how to, and then finally you'll put it online onto our data management site. So I wanted to show you really quick what our data management site looks like. Um, this website obviously is going to be in this PowerPoint, so you can check it out. The first thing you're going to do when you get here is log in with your Google Plus account up here. 
And the other thing that I'll say really quickly is that this site is written, um, was written by our software engineer that sits two floors up from us right now. Um, so if you guys ever see bugs in this website, or if you think there's something that would work better, or something that doesn't make sense, you can always email us and say, hey, this one site, send us a screenshot, and be like, this page does not look right. Like, this could be way better organized, and this is how I think it should look. You can send us an email, and I'll send it to our software engineer, and he can fix it pretty much that day. So that's kind of a cool addition to this. All right, so when you do sign in, I've, I've obviously already used this site before, but here are all of my systems that I created. Okay, and on your landing page, it kind of shows you what your most recent values are that you collected, all of your data. So if I click on this system here, it shows me all of my metadata again, right? The background information. So my technique, have you guys read about aquaponic growing techniques yet? Anyone? There's three kind of main techniques. I'll let you guys read about those a little bit more. Um, so my technique here is deep water culture. Here's my location. Um, I'm using Mozambique tilapia. There's 20 of them. I have 18 heads of lettuce. And here is my location in Seattle. And you can also upload an image of your system. We just added that function like last week. So I don't have an image here yet. Um, if you're ready to input your measurements, you go to measurements, enter the date that you collected them and the time. And then you just go through here, write down all of your measurements, or you can use the strip color. Fancy, huh? This is also a new feature I'm excited about. <laughs> Um, and then it also tells you the last measurement that you took and what date you took that measurement. So you can kind of compare with your last reading. And then when you're done adding all of those, including like leaf count for each plant and height for each plant, you can click record measurements and it will record all of them for you, just like it did here. Um, lastly, actually, actually there's two more things. There's a socialize function, so this is a little bit like Facebook, where you can friend each other, you can make groups. Um, say like there's multiple people from Inglemore High School that want to join a group. You can make a group on here called Inglemore High School Aquaponics Students or whatever, and you can add them all into your group and talk together. Um, you can also just friend people and look at their pages and write them notes. Um, here are some of my groups. So I have the interns from last year all in a group, and you can write on, on the page of the group. So it's a lot like Facebook in that way. And you can invite members and see all the group members here. And then finally, you can explore all of the other people around the world that are doing this right now. So right now we have about 140 people. Most of them, as you can see, are in the Seattle area. And as soon as you click, it will take you, oops, closer into where you want to view. So up here we have one teacher that does a lot of aquaponics research. So her students, all of their systems are up here. And you can just scroll over them. And I don't know what that says. <laughs> and um, click on their systems like that and see a system overview. Um, you can also click here and analyze their data. So that takes all of their data and puts it in a graph. You can input other um, parameters. So say right now I just have nitrite or nitrate. You can also add ammonia. Um, what else should we do? pH. And let's do hardness and see. OK. So this is interesting because it looks like they only took two time points. Right? <laughs> so there's not a lot of data on here to compare. But if you choose, um, let's see, let's go back to explore. You can also just search for systems here based on the name of the system instead of like clicking on them over here. Um, if you look at someone like this teacher's system in Texas or in um, Florida, he collected data with probeware every second for, I think, or every minute, I think, for the whole school year. So he has a lot of data. <laughs> and I'll show you kind of what that looks like really quick. Ammonium, pH, and let's do temperature. OK, so this is hours since the system was created. <laughs> Everybody see what this unit is down here? <laughs> this is 1,000, 1,000 hours. So lots and lots of hours of data collection. Um, if you're not very interested in this data down here, you can actually just Zoom into the data you are interested in by clicking and dragging, 
and it'll zoom in for you. And you can scroll over any of these time points and it'll tell you the exact measurement. All right. Um, the other thing you can do is select another system and compare them by clicking this overlay button. Um, and you would do that on the screen back here. So you would do like Turoff, the guy in Florida, and then maybe an ISB system and compare them with one another and then click that overlay button. And they would be kind of side to side. Okay. Um, any questions about the website so far? No? So this is kind of another way that teachers can incorporate data into their classes. So graphing skills, um, math skills, um, lots of other kind of interesting skills that maybe they wouldn't be able to, to get data from otherwise and use for their classroom. So this is one resource you can share with them. All right, um, going back to our presentation really fast. Don't have too much more. OK, so here are the, um, all of the materials that you're going to make, all the resources that you're going to put on your profile online. And I'm going to go through them one by one really quick. Um, if you need ideas for how people did them last year, you can go on people's profile pages and click on them and see. So the first thing you're going to do is a blog post, and that's due on August 1st. And everything that's going to be due, you're going to put into your Google Drive folder in that shared Google Drive account that we have together. Okay? And I'll make sure it's all set up before we leave today. So blog post is due on, um, on the 1st of August. And you can essentially choose any topic that interests you. Okay? I'm not going to be super specific on that. Um, if you want it to be about aquaponics, it can be. But it does need to be about like, something related to project feed, not just like totally arbitrary. Um, so, so, so hopefully something related to sustainable agriculture, aquaponics, um, education, um, incorporating projects into schools or communities. Um, it could be about a specific like water chemistry parameter, like if you're really interested in chlorine and why chlorine gases off when you leave it sitting out for 48 hours. You could write a blog post about that. So all of those blog posts are going to be put here on our website. And here are some examples of like informational based blog posts, like if you want to figure out how to get funding to make your project. One of the interns wrote a blog post about that. Um, let's see. I wrote one on which aquaponic system should you use for citizen science, and I have like a ton of options listed there, so people can go there and figure out ideas for that. Um, we had an intern write one just on nitrate, um, one on pH, um, one on why data collection is important, one on ammonia, one on nitrite, one on the nitrogen cycle. Um, so there's lots of options there. Okay. And if you need ideas for like, you know, how to write a blog post, it's a little bit different than an essay. <laughs> um, people are, probably aren't going to be super excited about reading an essay in a blog post. They might read like the first few sentences and be like, OK, this is kind of boring. <laughs> going to switch to a different page. Um, so maybe do a little bit of research first on like what makes a good blog post, like figuring out who your audience is and what's exciting and engaging and what kind of images to use, right? So you can go through and see other people's blog posts first if you need ideas. Um, the second thing that is going to be due a few days later is your integration plan. And it's OK if your integration plan changes over time. Okay? If you think that this plan is going to work really, really well, and then you kind of start school and your administration is like, no, we're not going to do this. It's OK if we need to go back and change it. But I do want to have like, some sort of plan in place by August 5th so that we are all kind of on the same path. Okay? Um, if you need ideas for integration plans, the integration plan is literally just the home page of every profile, every person's profile. So this is what you're going to be filling out. So I want to know your name, where you go to school, where you're from, your career goals, description of your school, pretty much pretty in depth so that other people can relate their school to your school. Okay. Um, what originally made you interested in this project? What do you want to bring to this project? Um, and then you're going to lay out your plan for the project here. And then also share kind of what challenges you think you might face setting this up. So you can start thinking of how to, you know, address those challenges before they actually become challenges. <laughs> like funding, for example. Okay? So this is your integration plan. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, next. Sorry, I'm getting lost with all of the tabs. 
Okay, next one is a materials list and a blueprint of your system. Um, so those are gonna be due by September 1st. So hopefully in September you will have thought through like, do I wanna build a system? Do I wanna buy a system? And if I do wanna build a system, what materials do I need to buy? Okay, um, so here are some examples of that. This is Laura's blueprint. Um, ideally, the point of a blueprint is that someone could look at it and build it from the blueprint, right? This doesn't have quite enough information in it. It gives you some of the measurements here and here, right? But in general, or specifically, you wanna have, um, you know, an exact replica of what it's gonna look like set up so that someone else could build it the exact same way without contacting you, okay? So that's the idea of a blueprint. You can use um, like PowerPoint to make it so that the squares are nice and even. You could draw it if you would rather draw, it's up to you. Um, and then here's your materials list. So you're gonna need to list out the item name, how much it costs, also how many of them you need, right? You need quantity somewhere in here. Um, and then the vendor that you are gonna purchase those materials from. The other thing that is missing here is a link. Um, everybody should have links so that if somebody clicks here, it automatically takes them to this item so they can purchase it. Does that make sense? Okay, good, good. So that's materials list and blueprint. Um, those kind of go hand in hand, so I just have them due on the same day. And then donors choose. I mentioned donors choose is um, a really good way for teachers to find funding. And I just want you to think through this scenario really quick. If you want to work with a teacher and you come to the teacher and you have a integration plan, you have an application for an online crowdfunding site, and you have a list of materials you need, and you have a blueprint of the system you're gonna build. <laughs> Do you think that teacher would be more inclined to work with you or not very inclined to work with you? More, probably. <laughs> they're probably gonna be like, wow, they thought through this really well, they have a plan, they know where they're gonna get funding from, and they already wrote the application for me to raise money, <laughs> right? Um, so here is, I put a link in here, one example of a teacher up in Snohomish that wrote a Donors Choose um, application and she raised all $513 of her goal. So these are the components that you need for the application. You need a title, you need a section that's called My Students and it talks about like basically the students in your school. Like what type, what type of students are they? How will they benefit from this program? Um, what resources will this provide for them? And then down here, you have a section called My Project. And this is explaining to donors um, what the project is all about, how it's gonna progress throughout the school year, what resources they are helping to provide for students, okay? Um, when you're writing this, something important to think about is your audience again, right? Anytime you write something, it's important to think about your audience. Who are the people that are going to be reading this? Potential donors, so are those people students? Are they teachers? Are they adults? Are they kids? What are they? Tell me about these people. You think they'd be teachers donating, donating to other teachers? Maybe, they could be. Teachers don't have a lot of money, so they might be donating small amounts of money to each other to help support each other. Who are some other people that would be donors? Who donates money to people in general? Yeah. Um, you can talk to like, uh, businesses or even family members that like, may have like, trouble with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, family members and businesses you could talk to, that's true. So I guess maybe what I'm getting at is that this this is on an online platform already, and people with lots of money go to these online platforms to find projects that they want to support, okay? So like Jeff Bezos or, you know, people with lots of money, they go on these sites, and it's important to them because they are impacting teachers and students, and they care about education, typically. So there are usually lots of people on here that want to see impact. 
They want to read this and say, wow, my money would be really impactful here, right? They don't want to see something that's like, yeah, uh, me and my friends at Glacier Peak High School are going to build this cool aquaponic system, and then we're going to like grow food and eat it, right? Um, if you read through this, it's pretty interesting because Tammy says, um, you know, the premise of my program is to challenge students to make a difference in the health of the world. And this project encourages and models collaboration between students and industry, which is us, right? We're industry, um, Institute for Systems Biology is, in an effort to address global hunger. Ultimately, students understand the impact that a STEM career can have on the world, right? And she kind of continues on and on about how critical thinking and problem solving skills are important and all of that. So when you're writing it, think about like, what would someone want to hear so that they felt like their money was going to be useful? Okay, it's not quite the same as writing like a blog post or an essay or something like that. It's quite a bit different when you're asking people to donate money to your cause. Okay, and if you need help writing this, let us know because we write a lot of these all the time. But so that is your donors choose application. The other thing that I forgot to put on here is your project proposal, which here's your resources that you're going to make. Um, this is your project proposal. So this is kind of like an in-depth view of like, what are your objectives of the project? What are the requirements? How much is it going to cost you? Um, who else is going to be involved? And this is something you can hand to like your principal or your vice principal or whatever that makes the kind of big time decisions. You can say like, this is how this is going to work at our school. I already know how much it's going to cost. I know that Miss Johnson is going to help me um, do all of these things for us. I know that this is how much it's going to cost, and this is how we're going to raise money, right? And then again, they are more likely to, to work with you and help you at that point too. Okay, so this project proposal is another piece that will be important to make. And um, right here I have a link to the description of all of these resources if you need kind of a more... Um, a more complete outline. So this is just a Google Doc that everybody can look at and it explains kind of what goes in each of these things. Okay? All right. So this is kind of what our schedule looks like um, throughout the rest of the year. So first thing you're going to be doing right now throughout the rest of the summer is, you know, we're going to be communicating back and forth. If you have questions, you can reach out to us. Um, but you're going to be mostly working on creating those resources and then making your plan over the summer. So how you're going to get started once the school year starts. Or, I mean, you can start this summer, but your first step is still making a plan, right? Um, the second thing we're going to do is we'll have monthly web chats, like I said, via Google Hangouts. And what I'll probably do is send out an email with like a, go a, a doodle poll again and ask for all of your um, schedules. And then I'll schedule an online Google Hangout. And usually they're like an hour long and we talk about what questions you have, um, any updates that you have, what progress you've made, kind of just to be there for support for one another. Make sure that all of our plans are progressing. Okay, um, and then after winter break, probably in January sometime, we can meet up here at ISB. We can do like a pizza party lunch thing and um, hang out and see each other's work that we've done so far, and it'll just be kind of internal. We can all just celebrate what we've done together. And then at the very end of the year, in June, we'll have another ambassador showcase where you guys will showcase like everything that you've done with um, all of the community watching. <laughs> okay? All right, any questions about the schedule? kind of what's expected so far. I think this is getting close to the end. Okay, so um, there's three ways that kind of throughout the summer you can stay connected. One of them is through our website, so making sure that you're checking blog posts and looking up things that are new um, for the program. Also through Facebook. Facebook's probably the most interactive way to stay in touch because I am pretty good about like posting stuff that we're doing online on there all the time. And then we do have Twitter also, but it's not being managed by anyone right now. So. Facebook is a really good way to stay in contact with the rest of the group if you want to do that. And then this is another important thing just to talk to other people about when you are explaining Project Feed. Um, so like I said, Institute for Systems Biology is a nonprofit, right? So most of our money comes from um, grants that we write. So Project Feed does not have a grant right now. Um, so essentially what's happening is we have donors that are donating to this program because they care about this education piece, mostly. Um, so two years ago we had a, um, 
a crowdfunding campaign, we raised just enough money to be able to buy a bunch of these Back to the Roots aquaponic kits. And that was just enough for us to hand out to um, students and scientists and other citizen scientists and get them started into the program and get them involved. Um, but we did have to use pretty much all of the money that came from that one crowdfunding cycle. So now we're kind of back to our starting point. And so it's good that if you are talking to people, you can explain, you know, this is like a really impactful project for me. Um, they gave us these kits that were <laughs> relatively expensive. And, um, you know, if anybody's interested in giving back to Project Feed, this is a good way to do it. Because most of the money is pretty much just going right back into education. That was fun. <laughs> going right back into education. And we're buying more of these kits for other people, too. So the kit itself, plus all of the test strips and everything that we give people, is about $50 per person, just for you guys to understand when you talk to people. And down here, I have a link to our CrowdRise page, which is like Kickstarter, kind of. Um, so you can go onto here and see how much money was raised. But this is not how much money is available. <laughs> this is money that was originally raised. So you can scroll down and see, um, like, the last donation was four months ago, but most of the donations happened in 2015, um, two years ago, when we did our big crowdfunding campaign. Okay? And then, yeah, I just wanted to thank everyone in our, the Beliga Lab, and thank you, Courtney, and thank you, Emily, for helping today. It was super helpful. Um, and some money does come from NSF from a grant um, that supports me because I work on other projects as well. And then from all the CrowdRise donors on that page I just showed you. So before you leave today, I think this is what we're going to do. I'm going to have probably Courtney and Emily take you guys on a little tour downstairs and show you the aquaponic systems. You guys can ask them whatever questions you want. Um, you can ask about water chemistry or about the fish or the plants or whatever you want. Um, and then. Um, before you do that, though, for the next like 10 minutes, let's do these things. Um, I have to be somewhere at four, so if you guys can take them when we're done doing these things, that would be great for a little bit. Okay, so first thing you need to do um, is I'm going to open up Google Drive up here, and I'm going to have you guys come up here and give me your email address, and I will type it into the Google Drive account and share that folder with you to make sure that we already have everything connected before you leave today. Okay. Um, the second thing is, I want you to let me know now if you definitely want one of these kits. And if you do, we can give them to you today and you can take them with you. But if you don't want to use those kits, don't worry about it. We can um, figure out another way for you to get plugged in later, Okay, getting another kit or something. Um, if you have no idea yet, we can give you one of these later too. It's fine. <laughs> it's not a big deal. But if you definitely want one now today, let us know and we can get one for you. Um, we're going to take a picture really quick after we do those things um, to put on Facebook. And then um, down here, mark your calendars for all of these items, please. Um, your blog post when that's due, your integration plan, materials list, blueprint, and donors choose application. And the other thing that we need to add on here is that project proposal. Let me do that really quick. So that can go. It's pretty much the same as your integration plan, but let's do that later. Well, that's going to have to be before your donors choose application. We'll do 8.5. So this is pretty similar to your integration plan. It's just a little more detail. And that link to the project proposal is up here in your folder. OK? Um, one other thing about Google Drive really quick. You guys understand that if you open up a, a document like this, which is a Google Doc is what it's called. It's like Word, but it's online. If um, Claire goes in and types in here, everyone else sees this, right? Um, this is not just her Google Doc. This is shared with everyone. So if you want to make a copy of this for yourself and you want to edit your own copy, that's fine. But that means that you need to go here to this document, right click, and do make a copy, and then probably do what? Yeah, probably move this to your own folder within this folder that we're about to make, and also probably rename it. 
So it's not, we don't have 15 copies of resources, <laughs> right? Okay, so if you need help kind of understanding Google Drive and how it works, let me know and I can help with that too. All right, um, so if each of you could come up kind of one by one and make sure that I have your correct email address in here and maybe just line up over here, then I will add you into this quickly. Um, I don't think I need help with that. If you could maybe, if you guys could figure out like a camera, or yeah, a camera situation so we can all take a picture and maybe find a good place to do it. Okay. That would be good. Do you have a camera? Or do we need to find um, you can use my phone, which is that one right there. Uh, let's see. Where is... The... All right, so this is the folder that I'm sharing with all of you guys. It's called Workshop Ambassadors. That's what you're gonna see on your end. And then I'm just gonna go here and share it. Okay, tell me your first name one more time. Grace. Grace. And I think for a lot of you I have your emails, is that it? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Um, Alex, this, right? Yeah. This one? No, it's, well, it's Alexandra. This one? Yeah. Okay, so what's your email? Um, I think I put, okay, so 101. Oh, that's yours. One, yeah. This one? Yeah. Ah, gotcha. Okay, thank you. And Claire? Yeah. This one? Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Remind uh, me how you spell your name. Janvi J. J. Two A's. Oh, two A's. J A A? Yeah. There we go. Gotcha. Okay. Why don't you start with J U N? J U N? Yep. Uh, it's that one, but Gmail. The first one, but Gmail. Yan217 uh, at Gmail. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Does it have to be Gmail? Um, I would use a Gmail account, okay. but they compa they're compatible. Um, Clark. Clark. Tab. That, those, that's me, but not Gmail. Ah, I got gotcha. you. Clark. T-A-B. T-A-B. Uh, 000. 000. Oh, wait, no. That would be, never mind. 99, sorry. <laughs> 99. <laughs> <Gmail. laughs> gotcha. Make sure you write that in your notebook so you know where I'm sending all this to you, okay? Okay. A-S-Y-A. Y-A. A-S-Y-A. Yeah. This I don't know why it says, no, I don't know how to fix that, but that's me. Okay. <laughs> I just won't call you that. <laughs> yeah. It's Asia? It's Asia. Asia. Okay, gotcha. I can't figure out. <laughs> that's okay. I don't, it's fine with me. And, okay. Is there a question? Yeah. So on the board over there, it says, are they doing CRISPR research here? Yeah, we are doing some in the Blake Lab. Maybe you could talk to about that or like shadowing your. Yeah. Can you write me an email so I remember that? Otherwise, I won't remember it right now. Right. And I, I can connect you with the person who's doing it. Okay. Yeah, totally. We can do that. Yeah. And remember your name? Jerry. Jerry. J E R R Y. This one? Okay. Got it. So, just get clear. Yeah. Really good question. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. So, like, for the girl last year who did a TED talk. Like, uh huh. And I noticed listed in the due dates, like it was write a grant or something like that. For the various activities, would you still need to write a grant if you were doing something that you, like the TED Talk or the community outreach? And it doesn't need money. Are all the due dates, do they all apply to everyone? Um, I think that if you were going to do something like a TED Talk, instead of doing like a plan to integrate like an aquaponics system, you would do like, what is your plan for like getting prepared okay. for a TED Talk? So it's so, like customized for each yeah, person. Yeah, we okay. can customize each of them for you. Good question. Yeah. Okay, I have everybody up here, right? Everybody's accounted for? Here's our shared Google Drive folder. And then the thing I want you to do when you get home today or tomorrow or something, can you each please make your own folder within this folder? And I'll show you really quick how to do that. Please make your own folder in here. So for those of you that have not used Google Drive before, so we're all in the folder right now, right? It says on the top, Workshop Ambassadors. You're going to go to New, and then New Folder, and then name it your name. Okay, so there's my folder, and it will pop up right here. So everything that you make, um, or if you want to make copies of things, you're going to put them into your own folder. So we don't have a million documents with a million different people's names. Okay? All right. Um, what else do we need to do? Anybody want a back to the root system for sure today? And if not, that's okay. You can get it later too. You want one? Okay. You can take this one. You want one too? Okay. So you guys are thinking you're going to use those in your 
as your plan, right? As your project? Okay, cool. So here's one. Can you grab the other one from my desk? Sorry, I wasn't thinking we would need more than one. Okay, and then uh, let's take a picture really quick. You were thinking either in front of the screen with your introductory slide uh -huh. or by the elevators. So. I like the elevators. Okay. I think that's a good idea. <laughs> with the right. green background. 